Hello Dunlap families. My name is Leanne Cusack and I am a teacher on strategic assignment working in the curriculum department. And I want to um, review with you um, information from our that was first presented at our family information night on March 2nd. And there are a few updates in here that have been recorded here on March 11th. So let's get started. The purpose of this presentation, um, first and foremost, is to celebrate and share out the guaranteed and viable curriculum progress made here in Dunlap. We're also going to share out a little bit of current research in ELA or English Language Arts, so that's reading, writing, speaking, and listening. We'd like to outline the next steps in supporting our ELA curriculum at the elementary level. And finally, um, we wanna work together to um, develop a collaborative vision for our ELA instruction. <clears throat> so the first part of the presentation is gonna center around our guaranteed and viable curriculum, which has been our department's focus um, starting in 2019 um, and beyond moving forward. So to, to start just by defining GVC, um, stands for Guaranteed and Viable Curriculum, and it truly is just a common understanding for teachers, for students, for families. Um, what we mean by curriculum is a standards aligned, so that's our Illinois Learning Standards sequence of learning objectives and experiences that allow students to master concepts and skills needed for success at the next level. So every classroom um, at every grade level does follow the Illinois learning standards. We have a laid out scope and sequence of what order we teach them. And then to break down the standards into smaller, uh, more understandable learning objectives. <clears throat> When we say curriculum here in Dunlap, we are not just talking about a textbook or a packet of worksheets or a workbook. Those are what we refer to as curriculum resources, but it's going to be um, the above definition of curriculum that we are ensuring in every classroom. To be guaranteed and viable, is meaning that each student is provided with the same opportunity to learn a clearly articulated core curriculum. And to be viable means that learning objectives are based on priority standards that really allow for more of a deep exploration rather than things just being quickly covered. At every grade level, there are a ton of standards and there are loads and loads of information and research out there that certain standards are what we call more priority, um, meaning they leverage uh, greater gains by students than others. So we want teachers to really have a good idea of what these priority standards are more than others. So why is this GVC important? First of all, equity. It ensures that all Dunlap students, regardless of their building or grade level, have that same carefully reviewed curriculum, those high standards that we truly are teaching and what the students need to be successful at their grade level and beyond. Clarity. Um, standards are full of very complex, they're full of multiple skills and concepts, and a reviewed GVC ensures that those prerequisite skills are understood by both teachers and students. And finally, transparency. We want students to understand what success looks like and to have that, that clear understanding not only to meet but also exceed expectations and to work where they are as well. The different components of a GVC, first we have the standard. So I've, I've already talked about that a little bit, agreed upon priority standards, a sequence. Um, each grade level has a certain order that they'll be teaching the standards in. They also have essential questions. A learning progression is more of a deep dive into each priority standard. And student success criteria at the elementary level, there are indicators that are written in student-friendly language. And then finally, we want to have assessments that are tied to these learning standards and that are requiring students to show mastery of the skills. So all of these different components here are what are collectively referred to as our GVC. And here in Dunlap, we've been working on these different components over the past few years. This has been the main 
um, focus um, from here in the curriculum department um, that teachers, that teams, um, administration all together are working on. So I'm going to show you a few examples now of how you would see these different components of the GVC and the work of your students. Priority standards are the actual standards that are listed out on our standards-based report cards for grades kindergarten through third grade this year, rolling up to fourth grade in the 22-23 school year and rolling up to fifth grade the year following. So your report cards do not have every standard listed out. That would be pages and pages and pages long. Rather, it is simply those priority standards. <clears throat> All families have access to their students' grade level scope and sequence for each of the curricular areas, and those can be found on the Dunlap Community Unit School District Curriculum Department website. Success criteria are being wrapped up this year at our elementary grade levels, and um, teachers are very proud, and we are very proud of the work that has been um, done to put in, that has been put into these. So this is an example of a success criteria. The purpose of a success criteria is to take the actual standard and show what it would look like on a report card, and then to put it into kid-friendly language to break down what are the expectations within that standard. So I've got a couple of brief videos here to talk a little bit more about these success criteria. Hi, I'm Natalie Lancer. And I'm Sam Crosser, and we teach third grade at Dunlap Grade School. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to show with you this right here that you're looking at is the picture of one of our third grade standards and this is the success criteria that goes with it. So when you're looking at this, you can see all of the things that a student has to um, do in order to show mastery of a specific skill. So we're always looking at the meets expectation column. And this is something that the students actually keep in, uh, or we have the students keep them in their take home folders and we have them get it out anytime we introduce a new standard. So we make sure that they understand exactly what they have to do in order to show mastery for that specific standard. So looking at this thing uh, or this specific standard, one of the things that they would have to do is draw the number line, label it with zero and one, and then equally section it off and mark on the correct spot where the fraction would appear. So this is really a great way to kind of help the students know what they have to do. It's also a great resource for parents. So you know exactly what um, the teacher is looking for, for each specific standard on the report card. One of the changes that we've seen in our classrooms and in choosing um, assignments and assessments from the success criteria is that we're able to be much more deliberate about what we are choosing. Um, each time we choose an assignment or especially creating assessments, we make sure it's assessing those bullet points. Students know that those are the things they're gonna to have to be able to do. Um, and it's also really easy to give feedback to a student. Um, if they're still in that approaching expectation area, many times we'll have the student look at the bulleted list. Which one of these things is it that's still difficult for you? How can we practice that? What is it that you're not understanding? Um, and then we can also communicate that with the parents and um, specifically, work on that with the student as well. And now we'll listen to um, how, a, from a student's point of view of how they use these success criteria. Hi, I'm Natalie Lancer. Oh. And I just a minute here. There we go. I have a third grade student here from Dunlap Grade School, and he's gonna share um, how the success criteria helps make learning more clear. Um, the success criteria helps us make it more clear because um, it like I know what to do to do make or to be a three or maybe even a four and like draw a number line, label it zero to one on the far left, label it with one on the far right. So all of the bullet points tell you what? Um, what, what you have to do to get a three. And when do you see this? Do you get to see this? Yeah, it's like, in, it's in our blue fold, folders in the like clear sheet thing. Excellent. 
All right. So each teacher um, throughout the district may be using these to different extents right now. They will be completed by the end of this year. And that's something that teachers are continuing to learn and to grow with how they use these with their students. But that's a great example from some third grade teachers there. <clears throat> I have a Oops. third grade student. Sorry about that. Let's see. Okay, I've got one last teacher testimony from you. This is Mrs. Roki. She's a fourth grade teacher at Banner. Hi, I'm Mrs. Roki, and I'm a fourth grade teacher at Banner Elementary. I just wanted to talk to you today about how the GVC process has really helped me as a teacher. Being I'm pretty new to the district, this is my third year, um, it is really not only helpful to really understand the standards that we're teaching, but to also get to know the people that we're teaching it with. So being on this curriculum council that I'm in has been my favorite committee so far, and it is an amazing experience because of how meaningful the tasks that we complete are. And um, I love the work we do. I love the people we do it with, and I've gotten to know a lot of great teachers through this, not only at my grade level working through this GVC process, but also the the surrounding ones. I think it's really important to see um, <clears throat> how these standards all kind of go together, but also to see how they flow from year to year through the grade level. So it's really nice to talk with the grades above and below you. As a fourth grade curriculum team, we have really become great friends and appreciate how everyone brings something different to the table. And this collaboration is not only helpful because of what we're doing through the GVC process, but honestly, through everyday teaching life, we are there for each other. If we have a tough lesson or we're not sure what to do or just have a tough circumstance, whether that's through email, text, or a quick meetup, those relationships have made that um, option available to get that support that we need. And going through this with such a great group of teachers have made me really appreciate the district that I'm in and the teachers that we have in this district. They all really care about their students and are always looking for the best ways to teach them. And that's that's amazing. So they say it takes a village and that couldn't be more true. All right. So Miss Roki there is speaking to the power of this GVC process. Um, it's not just about that final product. It's not just about that scope and sequence on the website or the student success criteria that's gonna be in kids' and parents' hands, but that whole process, um, every time a group of teachers gets together to have a conversation about curriculum, whether that's the standards or assessment or how they're teaching it, that teacher is empowered that much more with that wisdom and those collaborative relationships grow that much more. So <clears throat> much of the work of the GVC process has been done, Hi, um, actually, goodness, okay, um, has been done through um, what we call our curriculum council. And we are so thankful for the work of our curriculum council. That is a dedicated group of 30 teachers, one teacher at each grade level at each building, that works together throughout the year. There are monthly meetings as well as what we call GVC work days, which is when they get a half day sub and they come to the district office um, to have meetings to create this work. Um, and really the idea here is that um, not only do we want these documents in place to then be used by students, but we want increased teacher leadership. Um, this collaborative working, the sharing, the inspiring others, those things that you heard Mrs. Roki talk about only strengthens um, not only individual teachers, but the teachers within our entire district. And this goes back to um, some of the strongest research in education right now is done by this uh, man here. Um, his name is John Hattie, and he wrote a meta-analysis of over 800 studies um, looking to see what has the biggest impact on student learning. And over and over, we're seeing this idea of collective teacher efficacy being one of the most important things that we can do to actually increase student learning. So collective teacher efficacy is a collective belief, um, a collective knowledge that teachers feel that they are capable of helping students to learn, that they are knowledgeable about the things that they need to be knowledgeable and that they can make a difference with students. So this GVC process increases teacher efficacy. And we like to say here in the curriculum department that Dunlap Eagles are always learning. So that is not just for the students in our classrooms every day, but that um, goes for the adults in our buildings as well. 
So with that being said, the curriculum review cycle is ongoing. It is a constant, um, that work of learning never stops in schools. And so <clears throat> we've created, we've gone through step one, which is that curriculum mapping that we've been talking about throughout the entire presentation so far. And we've also been involved in step two as well, which is reviewing and comparing um, the work that's been done, looking at student achievement data, keeping current on state frameworks and current research, and then matching that um, with any changes that we see reflecting, are there changes that we need to make within the curricular maps, um, updates that we need to create, um, definitely involved in this work and step two here right now. And then finally, step three is adopting new resources. So of course we don't adopt new resources every year, but as the cycle um, continues throughout the years, um, at times it is necessary to adopt new resources to implement um, and make this GVC really come alive in our classrooms. And that um, moves us on to the next part of our presentation which is that here in 2021 and 2022, um, we have been involved in a elementary ELA resource selection process. The goal of the process is to identify materials that can be used in our classrooms so that classrooms have common materials for English language arts. Common materials matter for a number of reasons. First, they ensure consistent tier one curriculum. So even if they're all the teachers agree on the standards and the objectives that students must be learning, we still need to have resources, the books, the, um, the lessons that are going to get that learning in place. And this is especially necessary um, to help our RTI and special education um, decision ma making process. Each classroom must really be sure that the materials that they have are doing what they need to do to then see what extra help, additional help students might need. Equitable access to high quality materials impacts all students, but it's most essential um, for any students who might be in an at-risk category and need extra help learning at school. And then it allows for integration into PLC discussions. So um, when teachers collaborate across the grade level and they have common resources, it gives them a common thing to collaborate about. Now that we've spent so much time collaborating about the standards and what do they mean and how do we assess them, then the next natural step is to collaborate about what materials are we actually using to get in the children's hands to teach these standards. So why now? Why are we looking um, to adopt new ELA materials now? Well, the last time the district purchased new ELA materials at the elementary level was actually 2008-2009 school year. Since that time, um, Illinois has adopted the Illinois Learning Standards based on the Common Core, and those were first adopted in 2010. So that's been even since the last ELA adoption. Um, the field of um, specifically reading and writing research has been booming over the past few years. So there's loads of new research available about how children learn, how the brain works to help guide ELA instruction. By the end of this school year, all grade levels should have completed their student success criteria. So that component of the GVC process. And then finally, the ESSER grant, which is part of COVID relief funds, has also helped provide this opportunity um, with an increased amount of funding that needs to be spent within a specified time frame. And purchasing ELA materials um, does fall within allowable expenses of this grant. So we have been using a multi-layered approach um, ongoing research to really nail down which materials we feel um, match the needs here in Dunlap the best. We've been scouring published reviews by third-party curriculum reviewers, um, nonprofit um, companies that are out there that <clears throat> devote lots of time and lots of resources to this. 
We have ordered samples, conducted numerous, numerous conversations with reps from companies with different schools that already use the materials um, and, and actually ordered the samples and really went through them with close eyes. Um, we've also worked with teachers to develop a draft of instructional vision statements, which are, um, well, I'll show you, we'll talk about that in a little bit, um, in a little bit more here, but they just are anchoring statements to what is it that we're looking for in these materials. And then um, teacher reviews throughout January and February, teachers have had their hands on the materials, on the samples. Um, we've been in schools, we've been holding meetings, um, just gathering as much feedback as we possibly can. So this slide here shows the outline of the work that's been done, um, the extensive work that's been done throughout this year, that partnership between the curriculum department as well as our curriculum council and teachers in general. So on March 2nd at the family night, it was shared with families that we had narrowed it down and that teachers were really looking closely at the following four resources. Um, Wit and Wisdom, <clears throat> EL Education, Fountas and Pinnell Literacy and Wonders. And as a curriculum department, we had narrowed it down to those four and truly felt that um, out of these four, we would find something that matches what we were looking for here in the district. Since the curriculum night, our feedback cycle, which began in January, has ended. It was all January and February. Um, we had samples fairs days in the schools, GVC work days, curriculum council meetings, um, teachers, upon their request, we would um, join them in their classroom after school on their preps um, to talk, um, to review the materials with them. We had administrative meetings um, as well as um, <clears throat> staff was invited to fill out evaluation forms. Throughout collecting all of the qualitative feedback from those different events, it was noted that there were um, common themes of strengths and concerns for each of the different materials. And those frequency of themes were then, um, were then scoured and we completed a qualitative data analysis. And the, just the numbers of the analysis are found here on this page. So to note, um, we noted that um, Wit and Wisdom here, um, all of them really are aligned to the um, Illinois ELA standards. Um, Wit and Wisdom has strong correlation with foundations, decodable books, quality texts that were used, um, ability to use standards-based practices, inclusion of social studies and science standards, rigorous materials, pedagogical alignment to the science of reading, um, Whereas with Wonders, we see um, an ease of use, as well as engaging online content, ease of differentiation. Um, and then on the concern side, amount of professional development needed, definitely the highest for wit and wisdom, as well as um, viability was less of a concern for wit and wisdom than it was for Wonders and EL education, amount of preparation, and then engagement and rigor, there was the fewest amount of concern for that when it came to wit and wisdom versus the other ones. So a lot of time, a lot of effort spent really analyzing the qualitative feedback from teachers and administration. So based on that, um, we have decided, and this is new information um, since the March 2nd um, family meeting, um, we have decided to propose to the Board of Education um, an adoption plan. <clears throat> the plan is going to have two phases. Um, this slide outlines the first phase. So here in Dunlap, we seek to immerse ourselves in a study of structured literacy starting this summer. So PD um, that is always offered during the summer, as well as the school year, will focus on ELA best practices that are centered around structured literacy. You might hear the term um, science of reading, structured literacy, they're one in, they're, they're similar. Um, five teachers from each grade, first to fifth grade, will pilot wit and wisdom during this 22-23 school year. 
And barring that that goes well, the other schools um, and other teachers throughout the other schools will likely enter year one and 23-24 with, with trainings during the spring of 23. All second grade teachers, um, if this were to get approved by the board, would receive foundations materials. So that's the um, phonics program that's already in place at grades kindergarten and first, it would roll up to second. Kindergartners, kindergarten will partner with pre-K to determine play-based literacy instructional strategies based on early childhood philosophies of education and conversations about common resources at the kindergarten level will continue. We are committed to the developmentally appropriate approach of play-based learning that still allows our Dunlap students to um, achieve our kindergarten standards at high levels. Um, so we felt as though a continued study in that area was warranted. And then finally, beginning in summer 22, we hope to offer letters training to our pre-K through fifth grade teachers, starting with a core group of 10 teachers and two TOSAs starting this summer in 2022, if approved. The lengthy and entire plan um, can be clicked on on this next slide. If you'd like to see the plan, it does go through the year 2024. So what is letters training? I referenced that we are wanting to um, get some of our teachers in letters training. Letters training is <clears throat> really, it's a two year, about 150 hours of online plus classroom application plus discussions um, focused on the why and how of structured literacy. It's really, how does the brain learn to read and how can teachers leverage what we know in the classrooms? The idea here is teacher empowerment. Um, teachers will always matter more than just the materials. So we can't just give teachers materials and expect magic is going to happen. It's the teachers that bring the magic. So when teachers are empowered with why are these materials important? What is it about these materials um, that's so good? Why does it matter? Um, then that grows even more student achievement grows even more. In addition, it's going to create um, a core ELA teacher leader group. So the information that teachers will be able to learn throughout this training can then be passed on during our PLCs, during SIP days, um, helping with creation of professional development opportunities. And teachers are able to earn up to 12 credit hours um, through partnering um, universities. Why did we choose Wit and Wisdom? Why did we feel like that was the best choice to pilot here with our students in Dunlap? Um, so first of all, there is a very strong pedagogical alignment to structured literacy, which we'll explain a little bit more here shortly. Um, we are able to maintain foundations. So Wit and Wisdom partners with foundations and foundations is a very well loved program that's already in place in our kindergarten and first grade classrooms. So this would allow us to expand it into second grade as well. Over and over, we heard about the high level of rigor involved with wit and wisdom lessons. We heard about the, um, the purposeful integration of reading, writing, speaking, and listening, as well of, as depth of content knowledge. This level of rigor being allowing all students at all levels to access higher order thinking, where if they can't read the text, they can listen and they can speak about the text. If they can read the text, they can write, they can peer, um, give peer feedback and um, work together to collaborate with the content that's there. It aligns really well with the GVC work. It's very easy to see what standards are being covered within the lessons. The assessments that are within it um, are, are structured very nicely. They align with our instructional vision statements. We love that Wit and Wisdom gets quality text into our students' hands. Um, it's not a basal, it's actual text that students will be getting. They're well-known, um, well-loved um, books that um, students would be studying. And finally, we are confident that the professional development provided by Wit and Wisdom um, includes really great philosophy and implementation. 
One of the largest curriculum review agencies out there is called Ed Reports, and Wit and Wisdom is extremely highly rated on Ed Reports. So this gives you an idea, kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, you can always go to edreports.com. Um, Wit and Wisdom is with great minds, so you can um, see more details there for yourself, but um, this gives you an overall idea. They are very highly rated. And so um, <clears throat> the last part here is we want to talk a little bit about current research and reading. So I've got one more short video for you about why current research matters. Those are these. Many people ask, why is research necessary in the teaching of reading? Why can't teachers just rely on their intu intuition and teach shooting from the hip? Just get in front of the classroom and do what you think or you feel is the right thing. Well, the reason why teachers need research is because which children should we allow not to have the best practices? Which children do we just experiment on? Certainly, you wouldn't want them to experiment on your children. I don't want them to experiment on mine. I want them to use things that they know works. That means they have to depend on research. We know how to teach children to read in this country. We have the research to support replicable methods. We want teachers to use it, and they use it in the best schools. I'm in and out of schools and classrooms a lot, and I see and view the teaching of reading quite a bit in my role as consultant for statewide reading initiatives. I can tell you that the good teachers are using research. Those classrooms look alike. You will see phonemic awareness activities. You will see wide reading to build vocabulary and background knowledge. You will see fluency strategies for children to read with automaticity. You will see in good classrooms teachers who question students so that they can uh, show that they comprehend the text. It is so important that children are reading at grade level and hopefully better by third grade because we see in the research that they have less than a 25% chance of ever making up that ground. It's not impossible for them to become strategic readers, but it's much more difficult if we already have a cycle of failure that has set in. So we need to teach children to read right the first time around because success breeds success. The single most important thing that a parent can do to help a child learn to read is to transmit a love of reading to their children. Let them see you reading as a parent. Let them see that you enjoy and love print. And I say this to parents, even if you are not a reader yourself, you can still communicate to your children that books matter. Teaching a child to read is wonderful. It's wonderful when the light goes on and they recognize that those squiggly lines in those circles truly mean something. And when you see it go when you see it happen for a child, it's like no other experience, I think, for you. Um, the other thing that I take uh, to heart about being involved in this reading education is that teachers come up to me and they are so grateful when I let them know that we do know how to teach children to read. And if you use certain research-based practices, Okay, <clears throat> so it gives you a little bit of an idea Those about are the essential skills. Have a hard time with that every time, huh? So it gives you a little bit of an idea about how important it is. There is an overwhelming amount of research about how to teach children to read. And um, as wonderful as it is, like she said in the video, it truly is rocket science. You'll hear that phrase sometimes that teaching children to read is not easy. There is so much to know. Um, and so we view that here in the curriculum department as our job to be abreast of what does the research say? How do we teach children to read? And then how can we translate that to teachers who then translate that to students? This is one example of um, what's called the simple view of reading. So at the bottom here, the overall goal of all reading is reading comprehension. We need kids to be able to read the words and understand what they mean. Um, but to get to that reading comprehension or that skilled reading, 
It involves two major components, language comprehension. So note, not reading. So language um, being background knowledge, vocabulary, language suckers, ver uh, verbal reasoning, literary knowledge. So even that listening component there, as well as word recognition the phonological awareness, decoding, sight recognition of familiar words. And when we can combine that language comprehension with the word recognition, um, it becomes increasingly automatic, increasingly strategic, and over time as each of these individual strands of this reading rope get weaved together, we end up with skilled readers. So I wanna point out how the materials that we're proposing fit into this science of reading, into this reading rope as it, as it is, is coined. Wit and wisdom materials act as a tier one language comprehension resource. So the information underneath this column here is really going to be what wit and wisdom hits on, whereas foundations is going to really hit those word recognition components. And the letters training that we are asking approval for increases the teacher knowledge in all of those areas. So each of these components of our proposed plan really complement each other and really work together to give our students here in Dunlap um, what we think is the best of the best of resources out there um, to really use what we know about how to teach children to read. Guiding us along this way, um, <clears throat> so we're starting with the pilot next year if, if the uh, plan is approved. And to um, as part of the pilot, we want to really make sure that these materials really do hit what we're wanting it to hit. And this is part of the place that we're asking for parent input here. Um, we've created these instructional vision statements and we've been using them throughout this year to help us um, think through, are these resources what we're looking for? And now um, we want to share these with you as families, and we wanna know, are there things that um, you think we're missing from our vision statements? Are there things that you think should not be in here, things we should edit, things we should change? Um, I won't read verbatim all of them, but we will always say that teachers' continuous learning and empower matters more than the material themselves. And that was a huge part of the reason we picked Wit and Wisdom is because we've heard amazing things about the professional development that comes not only embedded within the materials themselves, um, but with trainings that are offered through the company as well. Um, the standards are not changing, so no matter what resource we use, we will continue to use those priority standards. Throughout all grade levels, the number one thing that teachers said is we want high quality text in kids' hands. We feel so confident about that with wit and wisdom. And then that foundational skills are crucial at all grade levels. So even though um, K through two really is, or I'm sorry, foundations really is a K through two uh, program, for our tier one students, um, wit and wisdom then will carry for three through five for our tier one students, the um, ex so instruction with those foundational structure, uh, found, excuse me, foundational skills there. Um, integration, so foundational skills, comprehension, integrating them both, just like we saw in that reading rope. And then we want purpose. We want students who know that their learning is more than just for the teacher or more than for getting a grade. We want students to have daily learning opportunities that are meaningful and purposeful as they integrate reading, writing, speaking, and listening. We want assessments that help teachers to make decisions and to reflect. Not, We do not want students to feel like testing is the purpose of of their reading class. We want assessments to be frequent and varied. And then um, that content knowledge, by spending a longer length of time um, in one content area, as Wit and Wisdom does, um, it allows for increased reading comprehension and provides what we call powerful equity levers. So as students come to us from so many different beautiful backgrounds here in Dunlap, um, we know that by um, giving all students a longer length of time to study one topic, they all develop that background knowledge, even if they didn't all come with it. 
Differentiation is so important to us. We want all students to have access to rigorous thinking and on grade level content. And um, Wit and Wisdom really does this by reading, writing, listening, and speaking so that all students are accessing that grade level content. If they can't read it themselves, they're listening to it. Um, they're talking about it constantly. We're breaking text down for them. Um, intentionally teaching communication skills. Um, we know as adults that communication is huge, and so we want to inspire that in our children as well. And above all, we seek to constantly foster relationships with students and really believe that every single student can learn and can grow. Um, without that, without that belief from a teacher, none of the other learning objectives can be met. So above all, we take fostering relationships with students very seriously here in Dunlap. So let us know, you can use the feedback form here on the website. If you have additional vision statements for your children, what you would like to see them get out of their time here um, in Dunlap Elementary Schools, we would love to hear it. Um, as we move forward with the pilot and determining if um, Wit and Wisdom really is the best route, um, we will anchor that in our instructional vision statements. So to wrap things up, um, thank you for sticking with me throughout this long um, but very informative presentation. Our family and school partnership is so important to us. Um, we appreciate all you do to support ELA curriculum here in Dunlap, that encouraging that love of reading and writing, that interest in speaking and listening. Um, please communicate with your schools. Please communicate with us anytime questions, concerns. These are some of our favorite books here in the curriculum department that we read with our own kids. And last but not least, as you have questions and comments, email our curriculum team, uh, curriculum at dunlapcusd.net. We are here for you. We want to learn together with you and we appreciate any and all feedback. So thank you again for your time. Thank you for your attention and we look forward to seeing you soon.